Problem 2. Water flows into and out of the rigid tank shown. The water at the inlet is 400 degrees Celsius and 100 kilopascals, while the water at the outlet is 200 degrees Celsius and 2500 kilopascals. The inlet diameter is 2 centimeters, the outlet diameter is 4 centimeters, and you measure the velocity at the inlet and outlet to both be 3 meters per second. Determine the mass flow rate at the inlet and outlet, and the time rate of change of the mass contained within the tank. So, in this rigid tank, I know that if I were to call the inlet state 1, which the diagram has done for me, and the outlet state 2, then T1 is 400 degrees Celsius, which would be 673.15 Kelvin. P1 would be 100 kilopascals, or 1 bar, and the velocity at the inlet was 3 meters per second, and the diameter at the inlet was 2 centimeters which would be 0 0.02 meters. Then at state two, I know the temperature at the outlet is 200 degrees Celsius, which is equal to 473.15 Kelvin. I know P2 is 2500 Kelvin. I know the velocity at the exit is also three meters per second and that the diameter at state 2 was 4 centimeters, which would be 0 0.04 meters. Any other given information? Well, I know that this is water, and I know it's a rigid tank. So rigid tank here is going to mean that there's no change in volume. Awesome. I know a lot of information about the inlet and the outlet, but I don't know the mass flow rate. So the first thing I'm going to try to do is calculate the mass flow rate. And the mass flow rate calculation is going to come from the fact that I know the velocity, I know the diameter, and I know enough information to figure out the specific volume. If I were to consider either the inlet or the outlet, I have water flowing through it, and that water is going to have a flow profile that looks something like this, maybe. So the velocity is higher at the center, very low, close to the edges, but it doesn't matter because what I have is the average velocity. And then I use the fact that I know the diameter to calculate the area. It's the area of a circle. So once I know the velocity and the area, I can calculate a volumetric flow rate. So the volumetric flow rate of a cylindrical tube in a cylindrical tube would be the velocity times the cross-sectional area. This is average velocity. And then the mass flow rate would come from the fact that I could take the density of our substance multiplied by our volumetric flow rate. So the more convenient form of that here would be volumetric flow rate divided by specific volume. So I could calculate the mass flow rate by taking average velocity times cross-sectional area divided by a specific volume. And that specific volume will come from the tables. I know this is water, and I know two independent intensive properties at both states, therefore I can look up anything else I need. So at state 1, I know T1 is 400 degrees Celsius, and P1 is 100 kilopascals. I'll use that to determine the specific volume, and then I'll use that to determine the mass flow rate. At state 2, I also know the temperature and pressure, so T2 was, what was it, 200 degrees Celsius. And P2 was a much higher, 2,500 kilopascals. That'll give me V2, which will allow me to calculate mass flow rate 2. So, jumping over to the tables. If I go back to my appendix, I'm going to want SI units, which is page 925, and I want properties of saturated water by temperature or pressure. So if we go over to 927, we have properties of water by temperature. So the first thing I have to do here is fix the phase of my water. So I could either look up the pressure and compare my temperature to the saturation temperature, or I could look up the temperature and compare my pressure to the saturation pressure. So just for fun here, I'm gonna look up my pressure. So I'm actually going to use the properties of saturated water listed by pressure. 
Remember that these two tables are the same thing, it's just listed by a different piece of information. So, at state 1, I have a pressure of 100 kilopascals, and I know that 100 kilopascals is 1 bar. So, if I go to my tables and look up a pressure of 1 bar, I can see that I have a saturation temperature of 99.63. So, my temperature is 400 degrees Celsius, which is above my saturation temperature. Therefore, the phase at state 1 is a superheated vapor. So, T1 is greater than T sat at P1. Therefore, superheated vapor. That also means that I'm going to be using a different table. I need to find my superheated vapor tables, which is conveniently on the next page. So, for the superheated vapor tables, I need to look up a pressure. These subtables are for an individual pressure, and once I find my subtable, I can look up my temperature and get a value. So, my pressure was 100 kilopascals, which is one bar, which is right here. This subtable is, let me zoom in a little bit might make it easier to read. Okay, too much zoom in. So one bar is right here, and then 400 degrees Celsius is my temperature. So specific volume was my first column in this subtable. So the specific volume corresponding to a pressure of one bar and a temperature of 400 degrees Celsius for water would be 3.103. Scroll up, read that the units are meters cubed per kilogram. So 3.103, 3.103. V1 is 3.103 cubic meters per kilogram. And that was from table A4. Now I'm going to repeat the same process for state two. Zoom back out a little bit. Okay, so I can look up either the temperature or pressure on the saturated water tables and then compare the other property to the saturated property. So I'm going to look up 2,500 kilopascals, which would be 25 bar. So at 25 bar, I have a saturation temperature of 224 degrees Celsius. My temperature at state two is 200 degrees Celsius. So my temperature is below the saturation temperature, therefore my my phase is a compressed liquid. Oh, by the way, I forgot to switch over. So, here on the textbook, 25 bar has a saturation temperature of 224 degrees Celsius. There, you didn't miss anything. See, I just highlighted 224. Anyway, my phase is a compressed liquid. So, T2 was less than T sat at P2. Therefore, compressed liquid. Which means I'm going to have to use the compressed liquid tables. Ah, keep forgetting to switch. Okay, I just wrote this part down. Tables. Compressed liquid tables are on table A5. So, conveniently, the first subtable, let me zoom in. For compressed liquid tables, again, I have subtables for each pressure, so I can look up my pressure first, find my temperature, and get a value. So my first subtable is at 25 bar. So my temperature was 200 degrees Celsius. I read off that the specific volume corresponding to 200 degrees Celsius and 25 bar is 1.1555. And this is not in units of cubic meters per kilogram. Note that the units specified here are V times 10 to the third. So this value is the specific volume with three or times 10 to the third. So in order to get it back to the actual specific volume, I have to take this number and multiply it by 10 to the negative third, which is moving the decimal place over three times. So my number was 1.1555 which means that my specific volume at state two would be 0 
11555. And that was table A5. So now that I had the specific volumes, I could calculate a mass flow rate. So the mass flow rate at state one would be my velocity, which was three meters per second, three meters per second, multiplied by my cross-sectional area. So because it's a circle and I know the diameter, instead of using pi r squared, I'm actually going to be substituting that radius is equal to diameter over two. So this is going to be, I bring the diameter out and square it. This is pi over four times diameter squared. It's just a little bit more convenient, one fewer calculation. So three meters per second times pi over four times diameter squared. So the diameter at state one was 0 0.02 meters. Quantity squared. And then I divide that number by my specific volume, which I just learned was 3.103 .103 cubic meters, excuse me, cubic meters per kilogram. So my meters and square meters are going to cancel cubic meters, which is going to give me an answer in kilograms per second, which is what I want. So the mass flow rate at state one is going to be three times pi over four times 0 0.02 squared divided by 3.103. So three times pi over four times zero times 0 0.02 squared times one over 3.3.103 gives me an answer of 0 0.000304. So my mass flow rate at state one is 0 0.000304 kilograms per second. which is my mass flow right in. I can just copy that over here. 0 0.000304. Then mass two is much the same process. I'm just going to have the same velocity. So three meters per second times pi over four times this four centimeters this time. So 0 0.04 meters squared divided by my specific volume, which was 0 0.0011555 cubic meters per kilogram. So while I'm typing in numbers for forever, think about how such a small denominator will affect my answer. Would you expect a mass flow rate at two to be greater than or less than state one? Three times pi over four times the quantity. I typed that incorrectly this time, but not that awesome squared times one over 0 0.0011555. So my mass flow rate state two then is 3.26258. So all of those of you at home that said bigger than congratulations much bigger than. Three point two six two five eight. I don't need nearly that many decimal points. Uh, I'm a bad example. But regardless, I have answers to part A and B. Now I can move on to part C. So part C is asking me for the time rate of change of the mass contained within the tank. So for part C, what I'm actually looking for is dm dt. And that's going to come from a mass balance. So just like with energy, if I know how much mass is entering and I know how much mass is leaving, 
I know what the change in mass is. So if you saw two people go into a house and then three people come out, you know that the rate of change, excuse me, you know that the change in number of people in the house was negative one. So if I divide all three terms here by a small amount of time, I get dm dt and m dot in and m dot out. So I can figure out my time rate of change of mass by just taking my mass flow rate in, which was 0 0.000, three zeros. Yes, three zeros. Let me get my calculator out of the way. 000304 kilograms per second minus 3.26258 kilograms per second. So I get an answer of negative 3.26228 kilograms per second. So for every second that this is operating, the water in the tank drops by three and a quarter kilograms. So because my outflow is so large, the inlet of water is almost insignificant. And that's problem two.